Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 404, that's 404 of the Agostino Zynga show, how you doing, how you feeling, great, good to know, how am I, you know, hanging in there by the skin of my teeth, by the little tips of fingernails still left on the tips of my fingers, I'm just hanging on trying to do as best as I can with the time that we have available. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions regarding what I have to talk about. And of course, if you want to connect with me, you're more than welcome to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You'll find my links of my social media and all that sort of thing down below in the description. Make sure you click on that. And of course, support for your Patreon is always welcomed. Patreon, I'm going to do in the Patreon only show. Bonus show is going to be coming at you very, very soon. So definitely keep on top of that one. We you got to do is subscribe to today's check, check out my patreon at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a g o s t i n h o you'll find all the links there that you need to go and subscribe it's little as one dollar you know the equivalent of one pound where you're from you can subscribe to my patreon get access to my bonus show every week um only available for patreon subscribers so make sure you check that out don't delay get on that today and of course if you listen via podcast app you know leave me a little five-star review, share the show with your friends, download it, all that good stuff, all that support is welcome too. But yeah, here we are, isn't it? We're on the brink, well, in the UK at least, we're on the brink of um, the lockdown measures being relaxed somewhat here. So for myself, it doesn't necessarily change, it, you know, it does. Let, let me not be, um, let me not be, uh, let me not be silly. It changes a lot for me because the last month or so, oof, it's been, it's been a difficult one to be honest under lockdown, especially without the, um, ability to go and I wouldn't say live a semi-normal life but could do the kind of things that I sort of enjoy which is you know going to the gym hanging out with friends all that nice good stuff so the fact that now we have the restrictions a bit loosed and we're in tier two here in London so that's going to allow me to go to the gym it's also going to allow me to you know go to a pub and have a drink if it needs be so that makes things a lot easier to kind of deal with you know, um, with obviously with the pandemic still raging around the world and with kind of the end in sight to some degree with the vaccine, it is nice to get a little bit of respite before I am imagining most of the country or most of the world will probably go under some sort of lockdown again in the new year if the vaccine isn't ready by then. But again, I'm not, you know, I'm not complaining. I'm happy I have some sort of respite, you know, because there's other parts of the UK that are really struggling. You know, my thoughts go out to people in Manchester and stuff who have been under some really, really restrictive restrictions for what? maybe it's going to be close to a maybe closer than most of the year they've been living under some sort of heightened restrictions that doesn't allow them to go to bars or hang out in different places and stuff so hey man it could be worse and it could be worse but um we're on a brink of that so that makes things better and of course for myself um when it comes to the djing side that makes it a lot easier too for me to go to places like you know pirate where i've been filming a lot of my dj live streams so if you've been checking it out thanks again for your support all those um likes comments and stuff are much much appreciated uh, obviously it's something i've been doing for a very long time 10 plus years in the scene promoting parties playing in places so it's always nice to kind of um get some of that evidence out there and it's all well and good saying you do these things and being a bit of a what would you say being a bit of a being a bit of a low, low I think hometown hero. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not a hero, but being known or regarded as some something in your own, you know, town is okay. But then it's good to kind of get it out there and let people know, hey, I can also do this thing. I'm not just a guy that just talks, which is no, it's no problem just talking. But I also want to make it known that I'm able, you know, that I can do things, which is hard to kind of do on the internet without kind of coming across like a cock. So hopefully, just recording these um, live streams and putting them out there isn't making me um look like I'm thinking I'm bloody Tiesto or something out here. But you know, I'm just trying to do my bit and just trying to um have some fun, really, in it, you know. Um, club culture and dance music has given me a lot over the years it's really opened up my horizons allowed me to travel the world meet some interesting people and you know I think naturally I think most people that get into dance music or club culture they just end up trying you know to kind of get involved in some respects whether it's you know putting on a night whether it's um, doing a little bit of production DJing here and there you know 
handing out flyers, being a door person, you just end up trying to do something. It's really hard not to um, dip your toes in in that regard because the, the barrier of entry is so low, right? It doesn't really take that much to get involved. And you could always spot, a mar there's always a gap you can spot. Always, uh, there's always a, a sound, um, a style, an aesthetic that's sort of like missing that you can always kind of, you know, um, uh, offer up to the market and usually if it's good enough and people like what you're doing that you're definitely going to build up a following because I don't really you know I would describe myself as a pretty average promoter but I was able to do some pretty interesting stuff during the kind of heyday of the whole Dawson scene and that was all because I was just willing and able of course with the help of friends or whatever to just put myself out there try some interesting things and just give them a go really and when you do that usually you do reap the rewards so you know it's been nice to be able to kind of pay it back i say in some way shape or form by putting on my own parties by booking people which i love to do you know um, making sure you put money in your friends pockets and stuff when you book to play is always something i kind of delight in um so that's been a really interesting journey but again with covid and with lockdown and with my inability to not be able to go out to rave which is you know a big part of my life being able to dj at least once a week here and there on live stream for you lovely people on the internet is um you know it, it goes some way to fill that void it's not the whole thing because i remember mentioning to somebody the other day actually i was like oh um one of the things i miss a lot about going out isn't necessarily just a the going out thing obviously is a big deal i think i mentioned it pre prior but more so just the the ambiance of being around strangers right of being around just different strange bodies and the kind of atmosphere and uh tactile nature of it that's what i sort of missed the most of course the lineups are always going to be pretty sick you know in london we're spoiled rotten with some of the best you know party promoters and clubs and all that stuff around and festivals whatever right we're really really you know spoiled 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 for options every single weekend or every single week to be honest um but just the being around the people and just kind of, you know, being tightly packed into some little underground basement bar somewhere, um, dancing your feet, dancing your face off, sweating your face off is something that I definitely miss. And again, you're not going to replace that or replicate that with live streams, but it does help to go some way along that. So definitely make sure you check out those um, live streams, test mix on my channel. Of course, um, there's links there to the SoundCloud for the MP3 if you just want to listen to that. And you can find that link as well to my SoundCloud for my DJ mixes in the descriptions. If you're watching or listening to the show, it will be attached in the description. So make sure you check that out. Do not delay. What else has been going on with me? What else have I been up to? Um, United won on the weekend. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was nice. Um, United won against Southampton 3-2. Last minute goals from Edison Cavani. You know, yeah, well, goals from Bruno Fernandes to bring us back one and Edison Cavani. Um, obviously with an assist, he levels it and then he wins at the death. So that was a pretty interesting and um, surprising turn of events, especially considering how well Southampton has started, um, considering how much um, um, Hassan Hutu, the Southampton managers, have managed to get out of that Southampton team who a lot of people would say, you know, they don't have the best talent available on their squad, but he somehow managed to get them to play a certain brand of football and really, 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 really taking them up levels considering where they were last season and considering some of those, you know, more terrible results that they had in the run-up that kind of was, you know, was at risk of costing Hassan Hutu his job. But they've, you know, they've really kicked on this season um, started off really well strong team especially at home we always seem to have a bit of a you know it seems to be a bit of a um, banana slip for us going away to um, St Mary's anyway in general over the years but somehow we managed to come up clutch right towards the end and you know we seem to have a bit of a clutch player in um, you know Edison, Edison Cavani who He's a player who I wasn't necessarily that sold on joining United. I, I have to admit, I was one of the people that was kind of doubting why we would sign him in the first place. You know, that whole reason, my reason more so was that he was obviously available since I think February or January, February, sometime early in the year um, because he'd been kind of, you know, mutual agreement with PSG to sort of end his contract. He'd been you know, living back home in Uruguay, riding horses, you know, jogging, you know, going on hikes and stuff and just living his life. And it seemed like he hadn't necessarily um, decided what club he went to go to or, you know, maybe his wages were in the way. But regardless, it just seemed like he was winding down his career in, you know, in harmonious place and not really kicking up any trees about it. So um, 
then you look at it in context, then you kind of add the further layer of context, which kind of made the whole thing confusing, was that we just gave, or we just extended um, Odia Negado's contract until the new year. Of course, we went to cover our backs because we went to make sure we had a centre forward on our books, but it seemed odd that we'd kind of go for another striker when we had a striker already playing for us who didn't necessarily play that much. But then a lot of me, you know, a lot of people were saying that maybe behind the scenes, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has kind of called off of the Odia Negado hype and kind of seen that maybe he's not at the level that we possibly need and he's another a body to come in to can hope to kind of rotate the fours that we have because at the moment we don't seem to have the defensive stability i would say on the defensive i don't know whatever it is our, our defense doesn't seem to be able to build up our attack from that side of things so it looks like for the most part um soul shark has decided to kind of you know bypass the defense and just go straight to midfield and then get the ball up to the strikers as quickly as possible which is why we probably um favor playing on a counter because we don't necessarily have the players at the back to build up potent attacks even though i think in the first 20 minutes of our Southampton game we were um get seeing a lot of Maguire, a lot of Lindelof bringing the ball up from the back spraying it to the wings blah 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 but in general it seems like that was the whole idea behind it Gavani and then on top of it if you've seen Edson Gavani play he's a bit confusing because although he's really big and he's a quite a powerful looking dude he doesn't necessarily use his size and his strength the way you would think he does he uses his size and strength to get into good positions but he doesn't use it to bully defenders to back into them to pin them back he's usually using his size and his speed and athleticism to just run them ragged so he kind of reminds me weirdly example but he kind of reminds me of like a james vardy but like you know um uh, injected with steroids right that's what he sort of reminds me of more so so with that being said it's also a concern for United because we don't play enough balls over the top around the corner uh, through the lines to our front players for them to get the chances like I always equate whenever I think of my United's lack of coaching or lack of style of play I always think to myself like why don't we have like a typical goal you know like Liverpool have typical goals they score um, Man City have typical goals they score even Arsenal in some extent have a typical Arsenal type goal Tottenham even nowadays with you know Son and Harry Kane how they play they have a typical style of goal that they always score but we don't really seem to have them we seem to have a lot of really talented attacking players who just seem to be able to just decide on a whim hey I'm going to win this game or through their just their talent you seem to be able to skip past four players and bang into a top corner so that really was concerning me when as Cavani got signed like we don't have those we don't play that way um he doesn't necessarily you know he's not necessarily um in the vein of a Lewandowski he's you know he's more so like an, a you know a, a better quality version of a Lukaku in terms of how he can move and poaching in front of goal and stuff but we don't we didn't bring the best out Lukaku either so it was a concerning thing but it seems like again with Solskjaer's reign at United it seems like he's the one thing that he seems to get really right across the board have been his signing so far. They've not I don't think he's had a bad even though, you know, it seems like the Van der Beek signing, he didn't necessarily want Van der Beek. He was sort of kind of given to given Van der Beek because, you know, our tie is to Ajax. Um, of course with Van der Sar there and you know he just became available and we sort of just took the opportunity to get him because obviously he's a quality player, but I don't think Solskjaer actually wanted him. But regardless of that, outside of, you know, Van der Beek, or Van der Beek, sorry, um, all of his signings have been brilliant. They've been really good, like, and they've really helped to kind of add to the team's overall, whatever the cultural reboot is, because I've still, no, I'm not really sold in that whole marketing spill that they were kind of trying out there. But whatever it is that he's kind of looking for in players, and he's sort of looking to in players from terms of attitude, I think he's getting it a lot with these new players that he's signing and we've seen it we've seen a little bit of a shift in terms of how they approach games now again this is only you know the last four games or so it, it only takes another uh, a couple bad run of results for everyone to kind of you know be going all over the top and being all doom lordry about it it's myself included but it does seem like he has a few more players in this team that are more his type of players playing right so that does necessarily help even if we don't have the style of play, they're going to be playing for him. And I see a lot of that happening at the moment. No one's really down in tools. Everyone's trying to make the best out of the situation that's available. And again, do I think all the players rate Solskjaer as a proper top coach? Probably not. I think those stories and those rumours that we heard in the beginning of the season when we weren't playing too well about some players not being happy with this level of training and um you know the coaching body blood the tactics and games whatever it may be in game management i think those um doubts still 
are still linger and they're still there they're still present maybe some of the senior players maybe some of the young players i don't know but for sure that does exist but i think in general you can bypass it and get around it if you're social if you just keep getting if you keep getting a few more of your own men into that dressing room people that you've sort of brought in you've sort of given the opportunity to play for united who probably shouldn't be playing for united right like look at us like a daniel james you know he's never going to go on that pitch and not give you know eight out of ten not ten out of ten in terms of effort he might not play well but he's definitely going to give you effort. So that kind of attitude change in terms of him coming on the 85th minute and giving it all his all. Ezra Kambani coming in and giving it his all after being, you know, in footballing Exodus for the best part of six months. You definitely saw that happening. And again, um, Ezra Kambani, all props to the guy, man. Yeah, I mean, getting an assist, especially that assist to Bruno Fernandes is really underrated. The weight of pass, you know, into the box for Bruno Fernandes to control um, without even looking up, pivot, swivel and just top you know um slide it into a bottom corner it definitely needs to be mentioned and of course these two goals proper strikers goals diving headers um to level the game and of course then to finally win it towards the end was the kind of stuff that you kind of forgot you loved seeing at united right from the you know the glory years especially one of my favorite strikers at united but by listerade right he was kind of known for just having such a variety a variety in the goals that he scored but he just scored striker goals right sometimes you know um finishes inside the box diving headers you know headers over looping headers like you know volleys in the air like just really classic clinical striker goals that don't require you to have to like dribble past three players like martial arts have to do typically so it adds a different element to our attack so that was great to see man definitely great to see you know united winning at the last minute you know three two is always a sight to behold and then what else i get up to oh i finally ended up watching um tenant 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 by christopher nolan starring you know um david john washington jr uh Denzel washington's son and of course robert pattinson man what a great movie don't get me wrong don't ask me don't try and get me to explain why <laughs> what the movie was actually about um i just enjoyed it as a spectacle to watch um cinematically it was just gorgeous right um the score was amazing the dialogues are always interesting the overall context of the movie and its themes and you know um seizing the moment time travel politics arms dealing all these really interesting themes popping up all over the place man what a great movie and i think maybe because i watched the prestige um a few weeks ago so it's still fresh in my memory it sort of reminded me of that a lot i don't know why uh, maybe some people here say it's a lot like inception maybe it's an inception sequel but regardless man it's such a good bloody movie really really good and one of the interesting parts about it was um john david washington right so this guy of course is um denzel washington's denzel washington's son he's obviously went you know um out of his way to kind of um distance himself from his father a little bit you know change his name up make sure that everyone kind of rates him for his own acting pre-credentials but the one thing that i clocked straight away from the you know opening sort of sequences when he's running i'm not going to spoil any of the movie for you but he's running one of the opening sequences and i'm like oh wow he's got really good running form for somebody that is an actor in it and then I remembered, oh yeah, shit, he used to play American football, right? He used to, like, I think he was in a practice squad or something, but he basically is, you know, he's played, you know, he's, um, he's played football or he's been an athlete for the, for the majority of his kind of early career. Um, so that kind of did shine through because you see a lot with the actors, especially somebody like a John Tom Cruise, right? Let's see if I can get it. Tom Cruise has this way of running. I've got a research for earlier, actually. He has this exaggerated, don't get me wrong. This actually, in terms of pose, looks pretty good here. This is an image of Tom Cruise running in maybe Mission Impossible. Um, so it's quite a good pose in terms of, you know, he's leaning forward. He's running on his toes, but he has this exaggerated form where he's always sort of like running like a robot, right? Shoulders and arms are just like swinging really, really hard in a really unnatural motion. Something that you'd kind of, it seems like he's sort of like saying one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four in his head, right? So I can now instead of just naturally running. And you saw the difference between how he runs, you know, Tom Cruise, and how that John David Washington. Let me see if I can actually find him running. What's his? Is it John David Washington? Right, uh, running tenant. Let's see if we can. If someone's got it on here, someone must have a, a little image of him running in that movie. Let's see if I can find it. Nah, it's nothing. It's not in here. He's not running. 
oh, but anyway, he, he he does look great in it running and oh, such a it, it, obviously you can see him here practicing here, Hollywood star. Did you practice it? Practicing where is this? What is this? Son of Hollywood star? Da, da, da. Yeah, but he does have a footballing background, so I've definitely explained why he was able to just look a little bit more natural in his running stride and pattern. So that was quite interesting to see. He's far bigger there in it than he is in the movie. He's super skinny in the movie, super slim, sorry, I'd say. So yeah, that's awesome to see. But definitely check it out, man. It's available now, I think, on most streaming platforms. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, it's still showing the cinemas oddly enough which is interesting considering most cinemas are closed now but um, definitely a great movie and again Christopher Nolan just has a really good way of make building these entire worlds within worlds in his movies isn't it right it's the sense of sort of escapism the sort of you sort of start questioning whenever I especially watch from the cinema whenever you watch a Christopher Nolan movie and you and then you kind of close your laptop or you step out of the cinema it always feels like you have to kind of take a little bit of a moment to recalibrate yourself with the outside world he sort of has that ability to kind of somehow influence your dare i say conscious mind in what you're sort of living the reality you're living in now in some odd way that you don't really get in other movies other movies you can watch them just as movies but in some way he's able to kind of you know transport you into his world and when it ends you have to sort of transport yourself back into the world that you're living in now at the moment so that was what i got from i was like jesus man i forgot how good christian Nolan this is a director in it written and directed by him tenant definitely check it out man again robert pattinson what a stellar performance i really really am looking forward to after seeing robert pattinson in tenant i'm really looking forward to seeing what he does with batman I think he's going to be a great Batman. A really, 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 really good Batman. Um, he was amazing in Tenet, man. Like, oh, just really, really good. So, yeah, um, let's see going forward. Hopefully, we see a little bit more um, clips of that coming forward. I'm not too sure what they've done with it so far. I remember hearing that they were like, um, that they're having a lot of issues with people catching COVID during the filming and, you know, with it being filmed in, I guess, parts of LA and LA having a bit of a bad time with the COVID cases and just in general, you know, Gavin Newsom seems to be hell bent on making it as difficult as possible for some industries to get up and working and some to, you know, not to continue to work. So let's see, hopefully that finishes up very, very soon and we have a little update on that one coming soon. Um, what else did I do? So I watched Tenant, and then oh, did I mention industry? Have I talked about industry before? I, I think I have talked about industry, but in case I haven't, let me repeat it again. Please watch the industry or industry only itself. It's a it's a drama TV series uh, based on these graduates who enter the financial world for the first time, and it sort of follows their individual journeys, right? Um, you know, various different individuals from different sort of backgrounds, colors and creeds, um, countries and all that malarkey, and it kind of um, displays and shows you exact, well, I won't say exactly, but it shows you the kind of different struggles each has in terms of acclimatizing themselves with this fast-paced environment. And it is bloody stellar. I incorrectly said Leonard Dunham like basically created this, but she didn't. She directed the first episode. But apart from that, it's really well done. And I, I don't know how they managed to somehow make a drama that's based in London and made by, I guess, well, it's, it's on HBO in the US, um, but it's shown here on the BBC. But somehow it has a very London feel to it without looking like um, Line of Duty or the bill or spooks you know not 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 to say those series are bad because i watch all of them but it doesn't have that sort of like slapstick quality of british tv series that it sometimes have that kind of sheen it sort of looks american-y without looking too american -y. it doesn't look like criminal mind it doesn't look like suits but it just looks really good it's a very very well put together tv series um only three episodes in it's the kind of thing that i'm legitimately looking forward to watching week in week out whenever it's available on streaming services which is making it again i think there is something to be said for series dropping every week on the streaming platform as opposed to just be able to binge watch them on netflix i know i remember in the past i think it might have been with um what was it with it might have been with ozarks or something i don't know what it was there was some series that came out on netflix recently that i was a little bit annoyed that they sort of like switched up and started doing them weekly um maybe it was game of i don't know it might it can't have been game of thrones but regardless there is something to be said for a decent tv again it has to be good first if the tv series is good 
it probably is within the best interest of the production company or whoever's putting it together to make sure that they they don't leave it to end if they do release it on a streaming service that it's only available uh weekly right you drop the episodes per week that's the best way to do it of course don't do that annoying thing that some series do where they kind of they would um sell only six episodes if it's successful then they top it up again but then in between that time you have to wait four months and episode to drop no if it's good and you've ordered you know you've made a, a full first season sell it to places shop it around if someone picks it up make sure that they only drop the episodes once per week and if it's halfway decent it's definitely going to build up a following you saw it happening with the boys you're on amazon the boys is a good example a lot of the hype around the boys of course is a great tv series right a, an amazing spin on the superhero genre but again the anticipation of having that next episode drop especially the way those ep episodes were done they always kind of ended on a really interesting cliffhanger um it was kind of within their best interest to be like hey let's just drop these per week let's not be able, let's not give them just out it's not just you know, front load them for people to watch in, on one weekend there's no sense of kind of appreciation don't end up building a connection with the characters and it, there's just something about it i don't know what it just works you know being able to kind of catch something every week looking forward to it remembering pizza's parts of the story um, following you you kind of pay attention more to the character arcs it's just a, a far better experience of um, watching a tv series i guess in my experience same way i would equate it to like the difference between like um a physical book or well, just the bad uh, uh, example is a running book but the, regardless i've definitely retained a lot more information reading a physical book than i do listen to audiobooks which i listen to a lot of and that's because usually you're having to sort of visualize whatever you're reading as you're reading it right or sometimes it's the images that you kind of remember but with the audiobook it's sort of passive listening and i think streaming services when they just give you the entire season you're sort of passively watching them especially in my experience i tend to sometimes skip past some bits especially if it's like mindless dialogue i don't need to be you know listening to or it's like a love scene i'll just skip past it because i want to get to the main action bits of the actual series which is obviously you know not the way to watch things but that's i'm assuming a lot of people do that too so you tend to avoid that when you're dropping them once per week see if you're going to sit down and actually watch it i think you'll see the same thing happen with euphoria a lot of that is kind of like you know the gap the time that it gives you to kind of breathe in between stuff to kind of see it like you need that you would definitely 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 need it so definitely check that out again really really good um series um there's a lot of um highbrow financial jargon thrown in there that's sort of hard to keep abreast of but generally just as like an overall show it is bloody amazing honestly it's one of it's one of my favorite shows i've been able to watch recently um and again maybe a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's not a lot on tv at the moment so it's kind of hard to kind of you know um make something bad because everyone's going to give you a chance but for sure man it's definitely a very enjoyable series just alone just a little touches of styling details like you know the abundance of body warmers of people that are wearing in there um the sort of bombastic -y sort of like silly attitudes of some of the financial guys the excessive 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 portrayal of, of drugs in this series is very accurate as well especially if you've been around the liverpool area bank area you know a lot you've kind of seen a lot of these familiar sort of faces and characters are hanging around these places so definitely you will see a lot of yourself if you work in the industry and people that you might know if you've definitely been around or in or you know people that are around in that industry as well so definitely check that out man industry available on hbo and bbc now that's what i've been checking out anyway let's move on to some topics that i've kind of specked out here for the podcast itself Let's move away from all that good talk. Um, story number one that I thought was interesting, right? <laughs> Such an absolutely hilarious headline and something that I kind of thought, you know what, this might explain something else. So there's this pretty ludicrous, ludicrous, ludicrous article that came out recently um, about this. So the headline reads there from Business Insider. An anti-gay Hungarian politician has resigned after being caught by the police fleeing a 25-man orgy through a window. Listen, an anti-gay Hungarian politician has resigned after being caught by the police fleeing a 25-man orgy for a window. That is absolutely insane, right? But I was thinking that headline might explain why some of us have a bit of an aversion or a negative reaction to people who virtue signal, 
work signal religious signaling whatever they do right when they're kind of o overtly trying to tell you how much of a good person they are through the deeds that they're doing or they're overtly against one person's way of living their or one group of people's way of living their lives or they have very odd strong views about certain success of society in general i think we are predisposed to kind of look at these people a bit out of the corner of our eye and be like hmm you there's something not quite genuine about you there's something um that doesn't really add up there's something that i'm not quite reading right and i'm going to hopefully over time you're going to reveal yourself that's what you'd hope some people are you know are flipping um psychotic in that regard and able to sort of like live double lives and you can just never find out but for the most part how many times has that headline um happened or come to light or you know you've seen somewhere in some way shape or form especially within religious circles it seems to be the more uh the more against you are the more yeah the more you are forcefully against lgbtq rights in general there's usually because you have your own skeletons in a closet and it's interesting just from a sort of like psychological point of view why a person who's clearly closeted in their own sexuality tends to occupy positions that marginalize the very people that you're kind of from the very community you're from why does that tend to happen interesting though, isn't it it's like um you know some areas especially in the united states where they have the most draconian laws concerning you know um african-american people and latino people usually are occupied by people from that same community who are kind of extra harsh to the, uh, their own sort of like brothers and sisters i wonder why that happens i really do it's very very interesting that, that seems to be a recurring theme in these sort of issues but just ahead the fact that this guy like again it's all well and good you know fair enough you get outed because you have a secret lover on the side or something but a 20 it's, it's never it's never something small it's never like oh he was spotted liking a double tapping a picture of a very well-known prominent gay um you know adult film star or something no it's always the absolute end of it it's always like oh this you know governor from the states i remember this one article about a sims governor somewhere who supposedly was against lgbtq rights or whatever state he was from and then he got you know busted essentially um you know engaging in some sort of sexual act with a flipping sex worker in his office after hours right and it was like it's never something small it's never like a little thing like a double tapping a picture or, or you know being seen at a club somewhere it's always the flipping most agree it's always the most like extreme <laughs> version of that lifestyle that they're doing and usually that probably has to do with the fact that you're kind of suppressing it for so long isn't it it's only so much like it's only so much of your apps actual identity that you can actually hide um day to day until it kind of just overloads and bursts out do you know what i mean in, in no in no pun intended that regard but god almighty man what an absolutely hilarious and also quite disheartening story considering because i'm um, you know imagine if he's got a family at home having to discover all this but hey what can you do so the article says following Hungarian MEP admits he was at a lockdown orgy, right? This is the whole article here from Politico. It says the following, a senior MEP member of parliament, I'm assuming, and Hungary's ruling uh, Fidesz party admitted Tuesday that he took part in a lockdown party, quote unquote, described by local media as an orgy that was broken up by the Brussels police. Joseph, um, Sa having pronounced his name, Joseph, let's say, Sajje, yes, I'm assuming the S is silent. Zajje, Zajje said in a statement that he was present at the private party, at which, according to Belgian press, police found 25 naked men, including an MEP and a number of diplomats. <laughs> i love how he keeps referring it to the uh, uh, private party right according to the press release from well, i guess it was but he's trying to just make it sound as if like you know there was old doves and a couple of flutes you know being passed around when in fact it was loads of flipping ripped up naked gay men you know probably having the time of their lives in a really swanky apartment somewhere in the middle of brussels just imagine what that apartment must have looked like in brussels just imagine Anyway, according to the press release from the Public Prosecution Office, a passerby reported to the police that he had seen a man fleeing along the gutter um, and he was able to identify the man. The man's hands were bloody. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's possible that he may have been injured. Okay, while fleeing. Narcotics were found in his backpack. Duh. The man was unable to produce any identify, identify documents. He was escorted to the place of residence where he identified himself as 
SJ by means of democratic passport. Um, Sajjir said police gave him an official verbal warning and took him home. He said he had not taken drugs and added that he was sorry and that he deeply regretted breaking COVID restrictions. You get caught at a gay orgy in Brussels and the first thing you're worried about is the drug taking. Now, again, it makes sense because he's from Hungary, right? And if you know anything about the, you know, the LGBTQ rights in Hungary, you know, they're not the best. So I I would assume the quite puritanical, overly conservative Christian um you know lifestyle or christian you know way of living that they have there in hungary probably doesn't necessarily lend itself that well to excuses of taking drugs with you know naked men all over the place and recently i think they passed a really crazy law where they basically put into um legislation that only heterosexual couples in hungary are able to adopt kids which essentially rules out um gay couples or people from the lgbtq community from adopting children it's also recognizes that uh, parents can only be male and female like those are really um um clever uses of wording and stuff to kind of essentially um segregate and sort of push out one segment of your community of all of your population because you don't agree with their way of life or with their sexual orientation which is you know disgusting and deplorable to say the least so you can understand why he'd be very concerned with making sure everyone knows that hey i wasn't there Oh no, it's making sure everyone's saying he's sorry for being at the par at a private party. He's still not admitting what he was doing there. And also he's very worried about the drugs aspect of it. But you know, we will we would assume a twenty five man party in a in a lofty in a swanky apartment somewhere in the middle of Brussels is definitely going to involve some substances, right? Maybe all of them. Maybe all. <laughs> He says he was it was irresponsible on my part and I'm ready to stand for the fine that occurs. Fine, he says, you know, you, you got you know got a job made fine. The Hungarian, a long serving member of the Prime Minister's Victor Orban's party, resigned as an MEP on Sunday. He said in a statement Tuesday that his misstep misstep was strictly personal and added, I see ask everyone not to extend it to my homeland or to my political community. Also, I guess he went, okay, cause from, so he went to another country, he said, look, don't, it doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm assuming Belgium doesn't have that much of an issue with it. Hence why he got off with a warning. Imagine if he would have got caught at a gay orgy in Hungary. God almighty. An official close to the investigation said officers were um, called after a legal complaint for nighttime disturbances were lodged about a lockdown party in an apartment on Friday night in the centre of Brussels. Belgium announced a second lockdown last month with a curfew in place and gatherings of more than four people not allowed. I want, it's always interesting, isn't it, that to me that in a more, the more, I think we've seen it with Enrico Ora recently, the more affluent area you're in, the more likely of your your you the more likely it is that you're gonna get fobbed in by your neighbours, really, isn't it? Which is weird considering that you would assume most people who have means to flout the rules would flout the rules, which they obviously are doing in these COVID times. But they're also very likely to call the police and let them know, hey, my neighbor's having a party, blah blah blah. But in the let's say more uh, rundown communities or places that are sort of you know um stricken by poverty they don't seem to really give a shit everyone minds their business you know if you're having your party have your party I'm, i don't give a shit just don't come into my house asking for a glass of water do you know what i mean um and it continues here belgium announced a second lockdown da -da -da. uh Sajje is a member of the fides who helped uh, craft the country's constitution. He served as the head of the Fidesz delegation in the European Parliament um, and is a member of the Assembly of Foreign Affairs. The Hungarian government has cracked down on LGBTQ rights and last week, along with Poland, voiced strong opposition to a gender equality plan from the EU foreign policy that seeks to better bolster sorry, women's and girls' LGBTQ rights worldwide by challenging gender norms and stereotypes. In a statement, the Fidesz delegation in the European Parliament said that Sajja had made a right decision when he resigned he said he made the only right decision he acknowledged his decision just as we acknowledge that he has apologized to his family his political community and to the vote so he does have a family jesus yeah that's what that, that's when it's not really that funny in it when obviously there's a huge part of himself or i'd guess part of his identity that's having to sort of suppress and in a country that doesn't probably allow him to live freely and of course um inadvertently he's held hurt in not only his fellow countrymen and people that you know work in his party that he's sort of you know embarrassing in public but also most importantly or more importantly his family and his children or whatever it may be or extended family who are having to sort of like find out the deepest darkest secrets of somebody you hold in high regard in the press this way and it's never never it's never a good situation which is why really you know you should be trying to live your best life as much as possible because hey 
we have a very short time on this earth the last thing you should be doing is running around hiding in mansions in brussels somewhere um you should be you know embracing exactly who you are and fighting for the people that and fighting for the very same people that you're kind of trying to oppress but hey i guess we all can't be perfect individuals so that was the first one what else we have here talk about him yeah we have this other story right this is from the what's sack what is a sack b this is from the sacramento b um so it's a story pertaining to a comedian who um caught covid unfortunately documented his journey online and has unfortunately died a couple of days later and part of the reason why i'm bringing it up is that i feel as if like again we all know covid is real and it's really affecting um a small population small segment of our population but it also has a potential of spreading far quicker if everyone just goes out and lives their life right so that's not necessarily on the cards until we have a vaccine all these things in place blah 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 but there is an element that i think with that the media isn't necessarily helping things by always talking about these really scary one of not one of these really scary isolated incidences where somebody dies in very unfortunate circumstances right in a very very brutal and sometimes incredibly sad way to somehow illustrate that this is what is going on in general with covid that's not necessarily the case and this is one of the issues because this is headline says a comedian began chronicling his covid19 journey online and he died two days later so this is how the story starts it says here um joe lona joe luna sorry an east la comedian who called himself joe el chulo on stage just wanted his family and friends to understand the danger of covid19 he said when i would hear people talk about what covid did to them i always thought to myself man you know what i doubted it uh, it was that bad he said in a 35 minute video post on november 21st so his 20 uh to his instagram revealing that he was ongoing battle with the coronavirus he says what well, i'll tell you guys right now I've been put in a fight, Luna says in a video, which he intended to be in the first in the chronicling his journey with the illness. He said, I've been in a fight my whole life. Two days later, he died at the age of 38 in a Los Angeles hospital after his condition worsened. It was like his lungs were hurting more than they ever helped before, said his son, Jose Talavera, who also tested positive for COVID according to the station. So that's the first segment you hear of it, right? Of course, a completely distressing story. Thoughts and prayers go out to his family and friends who have been affected by his loss, by his death, sorry. But when you read the second half of it, it kind of explains a lot of why this story doesn't necessarily need to be put in the press. And that's why I sort of think like this fear mongering definitely isn't um, good for anybody. It's article continues. Luna admitted in his Instagram video that he was at risk for factors. Uh, he, was, he he had no. V Luna admitted in his Instagram video that his risk factors for the virus were serious. Not only did I test positive for COVID, Luna said, "I have pneumonia. I am a double amputee, and I'm a diabetic, so I'm dealing with a lot." So this is prior to him getting COVID right i'm not sure if the pneumonia is tied into it because i know a lot of people get pneumonia when they get covid or as a precursor so let's count pneumonia out but just in just these three alone being a double amputee maybe he served in the military maybe he just had an unfortunate accident whatever happened to his limbs he's double amputee and a diabetic where we already know with um, covid if you have pre-existing health conditions it can be really really lethal so sometimes i think when they talk about these stories I feel like they paint them in a way to make it seem as if this is the norm when this is definitely the exception and we know this is happening and again i don't really see why these stories get put out. again i understand put some story out there obviously there's an element of him talking about here's the way that he's trying to document his story and his journey blah blah blah, blah. but i think there is a bit of carelessness in how they word the headlines because again that headline how that reads and of course the first kind of main chunk of the story you don't get any indication of this guy having actual pre-existing conditions that would wouldn't necessarily make him um wouldn't give him the best possible chance of surviving or beating uh, covid especially also you have to keep in mind in the beginning of this he definitely argues or he makes it seem as if he was a bit of a covid denier anyway himself so these are all elements that definitely add to the you know his unfortunate ending towards the end but i just feel as if sometimes the media go out of their way to drum up fear 
for the sake of it. And I think, again, this is not me saying people should just go and live their lives. I just think we have enough information at the moment in terms of how you should conduct yourself. You have all the information you need in terms of distancing, washing your hands, wearing a mask, avoiding crowded place. You know what to do generally. So it's up to you as a, you know, as a citizen, um, you know, as a member of your extended family, whoever it may be, to make a decision that's best for you and your family, because it looks like, for the most part, outside the exception of some of the other what, other countries in the world that have kind of aced COVID and kind of got it down pretty well, and numbers are down, cases are down, whatever it may be. Outside those places, most governments have really fucked up, right? They don't really know what they're doing. They've kind of basically just been. Um, using the same trust and tried and true method of locking down locking down segments of the population again and again and again to bring the numbers down which hasn't necessarily been working so if that's the case and we will have to sort of like make our own decision you know um especially with the cove with the vaccine coming up sometime soon you're probably in your best interest not to follow some of these articles and news and sort of just think hey i have all the information to hand that's going to guide me through this process or guide me through this crazy time and you make the best decision that's going to help my family and go from there really but this constant need for the media to sort of paint um these really self-explanatory reasons why somebody could have been in a very compromised position when they got covid and make it seem as if it's a norm i think is dangerous for everybody in general I don't know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know what you think. Do you think the media are unnecessarily drumming up um, panic with people? Or do you think these stories need to be spoken about so people don't have this um, weird belief that they can somehow beat it by just, you know, uh, putting a hoodie on or something? I don't know. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions. So, of course, moving on for the UK, we've got good news for us. Um, of well, for some of the parts of the UK, as it's mentioned here on BBC, it says here COVID, what are the new tiers and lockdown rules in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? Um, so it says here England um, enters a tougher version of its free tier system of restrictions on Wednesday on a four week lockdown ends. As, as a four week lockdown ends, sorry. Northern Ireland has a two week circuit breaker lockdown while Wales is banning itself of alcohol in pubs, cafes, and restaurants from Friday, which is insane. So it continues while England's new lockdown rules. Just after midnight on Wednesday, the 2nd of December, areas will be placed on three tiers lockdowns medium, high, and very high. About 99% of England has been placed in the high and very high of coronavirus risks and tiers two and three um the placing of the areas in each tier will be reviewed every 14 days with the first review on the 16th of december which to me sounds like a far better option to we should have probably done this before we did the national lockdown but i guess the number was too high but hey oh, what can you do so for tier two which is where i am at here in the uk um Obviously, you've got the areas that are covered here. Unfortunately for Manchester, you know, your neighbours, Liverpool, are in Tier 2 and you're in Tier 3. That must be a hell of a ride. So I'm assuming a lot of people are going to be travelling down to Tier 2 areas to go in on a night out, whatever they're going to do. So that's going to be an interesting um, thing to witness over the weekend. But hey, we move. So loads, obviously, the areas you see here, London, all 32 boroughs are in Tier 2, blah, blah, blah. So Tier 2 rules as follows. Um, it says here, Tier 2, um, you can't socialise indoors with anybody you don't live with or who is not your support bubble, which is an interesting one considering that a lot of the bars and clubs that I'm sort of up that I'm sort of registered on their sort of a promotional email list they've been emailing out all these newsletters and, and alerts letting people know that hey we have table service and we're able to accommodate up to this many people so you're still you're, you're don't get me wrong you're not socializing because you're going to be in these little bubble table things but you're still around people you don't necessarily live with so that's a bit of a weird rule that one but hey we continue um, second one so that you can meet in a group of up to six people outside including in a garden or in a public place which is cool um, the most important one for me shops gyms and personal care services as hairdressers can reopen if COVID is secure which is great um, and they've also mentioned that gyms will not close um, at all um, throughout all the tiers well that's with the exception of a new national lockdown if a national lockdown comes in again which you know Gove has definitely said the other day that oh we're not going to go into another one but you know you never know with this government 
but I like the fact that in under any of those tiers, the gyms will never close. So I'm always going to have an option to go to gym in the morning, which is definitely going to be a lifesaver and definitely a benefit for my overall mental health. So that's pretty good. And of course, shops as well. Maybe I'll be able to buy some of that Jill Sander Uniqlo stuff. Who knows? We're going to try. Uh, pubs and bars can re um, only reopen if they serve substantial meals. Alcohol can be served with that meal. And that's something that's been a bit of a con point of contrition in the uk with this whole meals debacle right they've been trying to um they were trying to figure out what is the substantial meal the substantial meal count is it fries is it a scotch egg is it a burger is it a packet of crisp is it the amount of calories it contains really confusing way to do things but hey i guess they have to kind of get around this idea of people they kind of have to justify why pubs and bars are open and other places aren't so the way to justify it is by saying are oh, you eating food right in that way but it's just a bizarre way to do it right? what can you do and i think they've also even stipulated to some bar owners that if people aren't eating they should chuck them out of their restaurants or bars which is insane um it, it continues um pubs and restaurants must shut at 11 p.m and um, we've lost orders at 10 which brings the the drinking limit or the drinking time limit up, up an hour from 10 to 11 it continues the sports will can resume with up to 2,000 spectators or 50 percent capacity whichever is smaller which is definitely going to be a benefit to some of the london clubs who have been suffering i'm sure the most deaf or had been suffering in some way shape or form during lockdown so that's going to allow them to have some money to be able to come through um, the gates it continues here collective worship weddings and outdoor sports can resume as well which is flipping awesome so you can see a lot more people playing football five aside outdoors maybe the return of saturday league football um what's that one called power league all that good stuff that's going to be great to see um non-essential foreign travel is allowed subject to quarantine rule which is great and people are advised not to travel to and from their tea areas so those are the rules that are coming into place from tomorrow or from today if you're listening to the podcast so definitely if you're in london um you'd be happy with that in other parts of the uk if you're in other parts of the uk that are like tier three the very highest oof, it says the following um you can't mix with anybody you don't live with you can meet in groups up to six people outdoors shops and gyms and personal care services are can reopen um that's tier three right uh no gear the hospitality venues such as bars and cafes restaurant must stay closed just definitely the bummer um so i said the sports cannot resume another bummer indoor entertainment venues such as bowling and cinemas must stay closed so look at all these things that are kind of been refused for you to do and people are advised not to travel to and from tier three the from their from tier three areas so you can't go in and out of where you live supposedly but look at the restrictions look at the restrictions so you can go to the gym and get a haircut but you and meet your friends outdoors in the winter in the uk especially up north it's just going to be an absolute nightmare so prayers and thoughts go out to people living outside of london who are having to deal with this in general and of course tier one um there's not a lot of places that are in tier one southeast only isle of Wight, cornwall and the isle of sicily um it says here the rules are the rule of six is to apply it says sports can resume with a crowd of 50 percent or four thousand capacity and exceptions for these tiers and child care support bubbles and more so interesting way to approach it again um you know we are where we are now you know the government have done a pretty poor job in terms of handling um you know or in terms of supporting certain segments of our industry of course a lot of the hospitality sector is hurting uh, freelancers are hurting there's really mistakes all over the place everywhere you turn somewhere is definitely fucked up in some way shape or form but again um considering the time of year we're in and considering what's at stake and considering what's obviously down the road with the vaccine this is probably the best option that we had available for us to kind of resume to some level of normality going forward so i'm definitely looking forward to kind of re-engaging back with society and living world going out for a run being able to go to the gym in the evening get a haircut maybe hang out with some friends in a bar that's going to be definitely a good way to sort of like kind of shift my thinking and my brain because it's definitely been a bit of a dark one the past six months or so being kind of locked up at home and not being able to do certain things so that's definitely going to be a bit of a lifesaver in that regard and then of course 
um, if matters weren't even more kind of ridiculous, you have the whole sausage, scotch egg sausage, scotch egg debacle, which is a sausage, isn't it, right? It's a sausage sort of like outer um, that's been occurring with this whole stupid, um, non-substantial meal thing going on um, with the UK, where if you go and eat, have a drink in a bar, you have to have a meal um, when you're sitting down. So they're trying to really, they're trying to kind of figure out what is a substantial meal, what equates for that. And Michael Gove um, is being kind of grilled from pillar to post, really. And it's interesting because I think I watched some of the bits of the footage of him going to different TV stations and places and sort of trying to fight his corner and explain things away. And it seemed like he didn't really have an idea or a clue on the rules himself prior to him leaving the office, right? Or leaving the House of Parliament to go to these different TV stations or studios. He seemed to just be like figuring out along the way as he went to different places. He didn't seem to have like a bit of a white paper or an idea on what the sort of landscape was, what is allowed, what isn't allowed, what are the main talking points. He just seemed to kind of just answer and figure it out along the way. And I guess maybe catch up with some of his advisors. But I was thinking this is really bizarre, isn't it? How some of these politicians go about doing their job like they don't seem to really do any research any prior work before they, they don't seem to sort of like read up on what they're going to talk about um maybe um figure out where some of the points of sort of like pushback are some figure out some of the counterpoints are to their point where they're trying to say what are some of the other arguments that exist out there this seems to be like let me just figure it out as i go along but hey what can you do so an article here from the guardian says scotch egg is definitely a substantial meal says michael gove <laughs> what a world what, what we live in imagine the, the people are dying right on a weekly basis whole industries are crumbling um you know like the support system is being pulled away from from underneath their feet and here michael gove is giggling and laughing over our scotch egg and shit Anyway, it continues. The scotch egg is definitely a central meal, Michael Gove has said, as he performed a screeching U-turn on his earlier controversial position that it constituted merely a starter. The whole U-turn thing that people seem to be obsessed with in the UK, I don't really get to. I like when politicians change their mind um, based on the, um, you know, on the availability of more facts. That's not really the issue to me. I don't really mind that. I don't necessarily think that kind of equates to a leader not being um, clear on what they wanted prior. You know, you, you come you come across some more information that maybe um, goes against what you believed pre prior. You change your mind. You do a bit of a U turn. Cool, all good. As long as people don't die, I'm all good with that one. It continues. Asked about the status of the, the delicacy a day after his cabinet colleague George Eustace told LBC on Tuesday that a scotch egg would not count, sorry, it would count as a substantial meal if there were a table service and could therefore be served with alcohol by pubs in tier two after lockdown ends. The cabinet office minister said on the radio station a couple of scotch eggs is a starter as far as I'm concerned. 14 minutes later, he said on ITV's Good Morning Britain, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably a starter. My own preference when it comes to a substantial meal might be more than just a scotch egg, but that's because I'm a healthy, I'm a hearty trencherman. What? Who gives a shit what you are, man? He's got the most punchable face in the world. He looks like one of those like, rubber ducks, isn't it? You know those rubber ducks that you sort of like, those boneless, sort of, you know, boneless, they are boneless. It's sort of like rug around your hand. Yeah, he's got such a punchable face. It continues. As far as I'm concerned, it's probably just a starter. I'm a hearty trencherman. The government is relying on people's common sense. I've got, I hate that phrase, common sense. Um, alert, stay alert. All you saw stupid buzzwords. It continues. However, by the time he was interviewed by the ITV News shortly afterwards, the position had evolved. He said, a scotch egg is a substantial meal. I myself would definitely scoff at a couple scotch eggs if I had the chance, but I do recognize it is a substantial meal. So... <sighs> Go of the Chancellor of the, the uh, Duchy the, of the Duchy of Lancaster said that the concept of substantial meal had existed in law for many years, allowing families to buy sixteen euros an alcoholic drink with food, but he could not say what it was constituted. They already know what the rules are and they are here for years and now so of course passing the buck to the hospitality industry. No, not nice to see there. With businesses facing £10,000 fines, even closure if they fail to comply with coronavirus regulations, the government has been under pressure to set out exactly what constitutes a proper meal. Exactly, because if, the, if, if there's one thing a restaurant or a bar doesn't need during these difficult times, it's a fine. In October, the Housing Secretary Robert Jenerick said a Cornish pasty counted as a meal only if it came with sides. While police in Manchester found themselves at the centre of a confusion when they stopped a pizzeria from serving single slices only to back down after the restaurant pointed out that they were fucking massive. 
this is absolutely insane. Speaking at the Houston's, um, the Eustace intervention on Monday, Boris Johnson's spokesman attempted to draw a line under the affair by arguing that the principle was well established in the hospitality sector and declined to categorize sausage raw sandwiches and pork pies. So of course, you know, they've got egg on their faces. They're looking a bit embarrassed. They don't really know what the laws are, what the rules are. They're just throwing around these buzz terms and hoping people don't really pay that much of attention to it. And it wants to get called out and they get asked to provide more details. They sort of cower and hide and say people's common sense can make the standard procedure with this government. And it continues. In legislation published in October, pubs were told that they could only serve alcohol with a table meal that might be expected to be served at a main at a main midday or main evening meal or as a main course as a uh, either such a meal a table meal was defined as a meal eaten by a person seated at a table or at a counter or other structure which serves as a purpose of the table and is not used for a service or a refreshment for a consumption by a person not seated at a table so they could have all they could have just easily said hey a substantial meal is anything that comes on a plate right because you don't get a pack of crisps on a plate you don't get peanuts on a plate um whatever comes in some sort of cutlery on some sort of you know yeah some sort of cutlery some sort of plate bowl whatever that would count as a substantial meal that's all you have to do it's not that difficult now i'm i'm assuming not all pubs serve food a lot of the pubs in my area do because they're these trendy gastro pubs but a lot of places don't you know it's work trying to get you know an actual competent chef to do the work in your kitchen maybe a good pop-up restaurant it doesn't always work out well i'm assuming the overheads might be a bit high whatever everyone's got their reasons sometimes a lot of places just get by by you know um uh, ripping off punters by charging them four quid for a pack of crisps but you sort of know that in the pub right you sort of know they're overcharging you for the crisp but you're sort of willing to pay for it because you know you know that money's going into their pockets and helping them keep the lights on and you know making sure the ambience is nice and just stay open so that you can come in and have your beer so it's a it's a, it's a fair exchange so this whole substantial meal thing again yes hospitality industry knows best and they've probably been doing this for years they know what to do but just just you know cost a bit of consultation prior which i'm sure they did, they never did they probably didn't consult with anybody in the hospitality industry would have avoided all these sort of unnecessary moments of nonsense but again these government what did they what do they know not that much it seems like by all extent and purposes then a little bit of a hoo-ha, hoo-ha online via one Lawrence Fox, who I've only been, I've only, I've only got to know him, I guess, recently because of lockdown again. I've not, I didn't really spend any time on Twitter prior to, um, prior to these unprecedented times that we live in. I sort of kind of avoided going on it in general. Um, I've had an account since what, 2011 or something like that, right? So I've been on it for a while, but I don't really tweet that much. Maybe in the last year or so, my uptake has really kicked on. I'd love to see my overall analytics in terms of the amount of tweets I've been sending out over like a two or four year period. I'm pretty sure this has been definitely the most time I've spent on that app in general, right? Over my entire lifetime on there. It's great for obviously news and all that up to date stuff, but sometimes it can get a little bit, you know, um, it can get a little bit annoying, a little bit toxic, let's say. But in general, I don't really get myself involved in any debates. I just kind of observe stuff from afar, like, 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 retweet a few things here and there. And my feed kind of populates itself really nicely based on the algorithm or the stuff that I'm liking, you know, general sort of stuff. But I have been noticing a lot of um, the same sort of type of personality that exists on social media. You've got the sort of leftist kind of personality person who's sort of always sort of like pushing out their, I guess, liberal sort of ideals and way of looking at things. And you've got the sort of like, I would say the more conservative type person who is kind of going out of their way at all times. It feels like to me, they go out their way more so to make sure that they annoy the person on the left by stating hey i'm definitely against everything you stand for right and making it kind of very clear that they sort of stand against that and then you've got the other person who i would maybe subscribe lawrence in that kind of group where you're sort of purposely trying to be a bit of a contrarian whenever something i guess it's sort of similar to like what kate hopkins would have done but maybe she was a bit more vile with how she did it but just the idea that whatever everyone was kind of collectively agreed upon in terms of you know how they viewed a certain celebrity or something that's happening in society you would kind of go out your way to make sure you were saying whatever the opposite of whatever they were saying and it seems that Lawrence Fox has uh, decided to be that sort of guy I guess most of his sort of hype or media attention virality has come based off the back of that sort of skirmish he had on question time with um, a black lady in the audience I don't really know the details I don't really bother asking me what it happened but there's some sort of back and forth that resulted in Lawrence Fox deciding that he was this bastion of free speech 
and whatever it may be and then he kind of turned himself into this sort of like free speech advocate and now he's sort of pushing forward this um what's this pie he's got that he's trying to launch the uh, the reform party i don't know for real conservatism in the uk whatever it is but anyway the most interesting thing is he's he got into a bit of bother on social media the other day because he tweeted these following messages the first one said just had a large group over for lunch and we hugged ate and talked and put the world to rights it was lovely you'll never take that away from people stay out protect your rights if the nhs can't cope then the nhs isn't fit for purpose compliance is violence and then the second tweet he put out was this the the at nhs isn't my church and salvation its employees aren't my saviors if you can't deal with 99 percent survival rate virus you aren't fit for purpose you don't need to protecting uh, my uh, my elderly relatives do i also love your emergency care and will continue to pay for it for now which again is interesting but anyway that's what he said right and you know you know in the uk the nhs is a bit of a sacred cow we love the nhs there's a very strong history with um the nhs in the uk you know the this humble beginnings um the yeah, impact it's had on people's lives the the way that it sort of anchors certain different certain communities it allows different people from different backgrounds a way to kind of assimilate in some way shape or form to i would say in some regards it has helped a lot of people with sometimes race relations it's been a very interesting sort of experiment and it has worked pretty well right of course certain areas in the uk to have different you know different varying levels of service and what it may be, whatever but in general you know if you get ill if you get sick if you break a bone um the ability to just rock up to any nhs hospital and get fixed and get looked after by very caring and helpful uh members of staff is something that i kind of don't take for granted but of course during the whole covid thing there has been a little bit of an overreaction almost overreaction it's been a little bit nauseating some of the praise that people have been giving regular nurses and doctors working in hospitals kind of doing their quote-unquote job i get it over a period of time but i guess my question with this whole stuff would just be if you're lawrence fox i wonder what it is about somebody like this personality wise that makes them want to go so full hell kept so kind of that wants to go out of their way to be the hill to kind of be the villain on social media because there was i guess there was you know there was a conversation to be had about the nhs right um there is a maybe a conversation to be had about um survival rates of covid there is a conversation to be had about who's this actually affecting the fact that it's impacting our everyday lives and mo may maybe the majority of the population doesn't need to be locked indoors we can maybe get get by and sort of survive um prior to the vaccine becoming available by being smart and doing those things that those are all issues that we can definitely speak about but just the way it's being phrased the way it's being put out there it does come across a bit dare i say mean um and i really do of course it's kind of purposely done that way to kind of um, rile up the people that he's sort of opposing or he stands kind of um ideologically against but again, I just wonder what it is about people like that, that they want to do that thing. Why would they be want, want to be so adversarial? I guess it kind of answers itself, right? Because it is quite monetarily beneficial, right? It does definitely help you become a little bit more noticed on social, especially in a place like Twitter. It does sort of like lend itself to people being snarky um on there. You don't really get away with, you know, just, just liking stuff and being happy about the things that you enjoy. It doesn't necessarily get you the traction that you want on there right but taking the piss out of somebody or laughing at somebody's misfortune or being a bit of a snarky cunt definitely does help on social media especially on twitter so maybe this is probably the reason why he's doing it but i just don't know i, I wouldn't just put it out there for people listening or watching what do you think kind of drives somebody to make tweets up like to put out a tweet like this and to kind of sit back and you know be happy or not be happy like to be okay with seeing people saying some mad shit in your because i'm sure his mentions must have been on fire after he put these tweets out right it must have been absolutely radioactive some of the insults that he kind of gets uh, thrown his way and of course i'm sure there's a lot of people that support him that you know follow everything he does and think yeah what he's saying is definitely true but i don't know man I, the last thing i'd want especially during covid like it's just a headache living day to day the last thing i want is for you know half of the po say less than half the population let's say half of the population um actively hating me from my point of view that doesn't necessarily it's a point of view that a lot of people probably share but it doesn't necessarily need to be said that way but hey maybe it's working for him but again let me know what you think in the comments down below regarding that issue 
next on the list what do we have here oh let's talk about dutch because dutch is um updated us on updated us updated his fans mostly concerning everything that's been happening oh i kind of sound like him now because everything that's been happening in my life and that you get me yeah bro um but yeah dutch Avelli has updated his fans and the uk hip-hop rap community at large concerning the very 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 serious allegations that are lobbied against him the last week or so um concerning his um dms being leaked by a hacker um first the dms were pretty innocent there were some pretty embarrassing cringy dms between him and drake where he was essentially trying to petition for himself to be the head of ovo london um videos of him sending drake instagram stories of him listening to drake's songs whilst rolling up a blunt you know kind of fanboy stuff but you could kind of excuse that he's a rapper in his mid-20s you know newly found fame uh drake obviously has a bit of a soft spot for uk people to have his ear in general to have him following on social media you definitely be gassing it but that's about he's 27 years old i can definitely see him being very very happy that you know drake is following him on his social media so that kind of interaction wasn't that much of a big deal then it obviously progressed and we saw some other dms between him and him and some young ladies and again that wasn't much of an issue then there was a bit of an issue with one of them who sort of looks a bit like a child but she's obviously of a legal age um to be in a, some sort of intimate relationship with so that wasn't necessarily much of an issue it was another dm with another ex-girlfriend and then we saw another bit of dms um that another girl leaked herself via her own private um instagram stories with her friends and family or somebody then put out there this young white girl and it just seemed again from my own point of view looking at it from the outside in just a newly found a bit of newly found fame for a young rapper coming up in the scene and just essentially saying yes to everyone that's starting into his dms now is that advisable would I advise somebody if i was a manager and tell them hey respond well to it, respond positively to every single lady that slides into your dms when you're newly rich and famous probably not it's probably not a good idea you're probably gonna get yourself jammed up you might get trapped somewhere it might be you know set up it might be whatever it just might not be a good situation for you in the, in the future just take your chill pill and relax and you don't need to do that so far but hey i understand where he's coming from but then of course the allegations got a lot more serious when and that when the hacker i guess the same person um somehow un uncovered other messages that weren't somehow leaked with the first batch of messages i don't know why that was but regardless we saw these other messages that pertain to dutch Avelli, um allegedly being involved in the conversation or allegedly he was involved in the conversation with a 14 year old girl who happened to be the daughter had to be related to somebody that used to manage him who unfortunately passed away so obviously naturally you know the you know uk people in general just all across the world in general you know we'd have a bit of an aversion with um adult men speaking to children it's definitely not something that anyone kind of tolerates under any circumstances i think in the uk we have a bit of a uh an aversion to it in general we seem to just not put up with that whatsoever so it was natural that you know the, in, the social media went a bit crazy with it everyone sort of shared their opinions we saw more dms come out we saw the way that he was talking to the said 14 year old and it just seemed to be very grossly 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 inappropriate for somebody of his age and also considering their close family familial relationship it just didn't seem to make any sense why he'd want to be talking to a 14 year old via his dms now that being said i still think it's a stretch to say that there was anything more than what we saw now would i be happy if that was my um sister if that was my niece and i saw her talking to somebody of his age of his stature in the dms of course not would i want her to be around him anymore going forward probably not but in terms of accusing somebody of being a pedophile being a nonce i think that's a, probably a step too far um considering what we've seen on the messages but the concerning thing would just be the reaction around his family and friends right that was a really worrying part of it because i think if somebody's made a bit of a booby in terms of just being a little bit too horny in a dm just in general forget the 14 year old just in general that's understandable but when it involves a 14 year old there needs to be a bit of a stronger message to come out in terms of distancing yourself from those allegations and making it very well known that hey i am not this person that you're painting out to be here's what happened here's the facts and this is it 
you can't just let these stories rumble on and i guess the fact that dutch was involved this story when it happened he then decided to go, I, I guess he was going to dubai anyway but he went to dubai to film a video wherever he was going to do or escape like most rappers was doing for to escape lockdown they all went to dubai to go and hang out he happened to be in dubai at the same time the story was rumbling he didn't really want to address it directly then we had leaked messages of stefan dunn supposedly um getting into a bit of a argument or back and forth with another relative of the 14 year old girl then we had the other sister essentially trying to throw mud on Crepton Conan's name based on what the allegation was alleged to her brother then we had the mum coming out saying some absolutely crazy shit like it just seemed like they were moving in a way that would lead you to believe that these allegations had some level of truth to it and they're just trying to distract the public from what was actually going on and that was a weird part of it it was like these aren't just like you know no one's no one's accusing this guy of like I don't know he's not just cheating on like which is bad anyways is but he's not cheating on his baby mother do you know what i mean this is him allegedly trying to arrange a meetup of a 14 year old relative like this is ridiculous isn't it this is like a really serious allegation he never said anything about it. and again the story kept changing so um fortunately well the, fortunately i guess for himself and his career he's decided to finally come out and speak about it and sort of lay it out there and sort of say his piece regarding the issue and i'll just play four minutes of it and then i'll kind of give my um thoughts and opinions regarding what he has to say as we watch the video but i'll try and let as much of it roll back i know it can be a bit annoying if i keep pausing the videos let's just play what dutch really he has to say uh regarding the issue so uh, the caption says the following all the negative so all the negativity aside i don't want to uh i do want to thank everyone that's hit me up on my people and my family to ask what really was happening uh those to me are the people that really care and matter to me the most not the ones hopping online making videos stating that i'm guilty and paying off somebody's mum without knowing the facts there are a lot of fake messages going around on social media platforms which to me is just sick and sad and this is the level some people have stooped to okay um they have no idea how much this has affected the families involved again i just want to thank my fans and my supporters i saw you writing for me i've uh, i've seen the dms you guys generally knew something wasn't right and held off bashing me or completely writing me off and for that i will always be uh give you my all in this music thing i'm about to go harder than ever kind of a bad thing to say there but hey let's continue yo people man's adjusting the situation isn't it? But most of it is just dumb. I just want to stick to the facts. I want to stick to the facts of the situation. You know what I mean? So the first fact is I got hacked and targeted. Do you understand? So obviously, whoever's done this, they've deleted bare shit of my Instagram, as you can see, if you follow me. They've deleted bare shit of my page. They've deleted shit in my DMs. They've got messages. They've altered and edited them, which you can clearly see. But listen to this, yeah? The first fact is, yeah, this is the United Kingdom. We don't live in a third world country, bro. Do you understand? If that was real messages that you saw, just know I would get arrested. Do you understand? We live in a country where the system has a duty of care for a child. So that means if you post an underage girl's address on, on the internet, yeah, we have hip hop police as well. If you post an underage girl's address on the internet the police has to go to that house yeah and check on them for her safety they have now this is obviously something that you'd hear a lot of people that are incarcerated say because i guess they have a lot of experience with police and laws and all that malarkey but to somehow suggest that just because the police haven't arrested you that doesn't mean you're guilty is quite an insane statement to make but again if he honestly thinks he hasn't done nothing wrong i get it but it's an insane way to defend yourself. Just because, look, I didn't get arrested. Like, no one's gone after me. So that means nothing. There's nothing to the story. Um, of course, the police have a duty of care, but they're going to investigate it. They're going to question the family. If the family don't want to carry on um, pursuing any charges against you, then the case for matter will probably be dropped. They might have somebody analyzing from afar, wherever it may be. But to suggest that somehow, just because the police haven't arrested you, you're okay is a wild statement. But hey. Have a duty of care and check on the whole family, in fact they have a duty of care to do that. Do you understand that? So the police have gone to do that. Do you understand? They've gone through the situation with the family. Do you understand? They've, the family has put out a statement saying, this is fake news and fabricated messages. The mom, the children, they've all put out a message saying this are fabricated messages. Do you understand? 
Then people say, oh, you pay them. Bro, do you know how sick you lot are, bro? If someone was molesting your daughter, bro, or trying to groom your daughter, are you going to accept payment for that, bro? To not press charges on them? Are you silly or something? Is your mum going to do that for 50 bags? I'm not Michael Jackson, bro. So people are saying for 50 bags, this was going on. You have to understand what you're talking about. These are some disgusting things you lot are saying. Would maybe your mum will take 50 bags for that? Interesting point he makes about the Michael Jackson film because there was, if you remember watching and never the documentary where is it Fire Neverland where the three guys or two guys over there were um, basically alleged that Michael Jackson sexually assaulted them when they were younger. When we people watched that documentary, there was a lot of conversation online about people just wondering like how could the parents allow their children to be around Michael Jackson knowing that he was purposely asking them to sort of like stay behind, let them go in a room to loan together. Like why would they allow that kind of scenario to ever kind of transpire transpire in front of their eyes, right? And I remember someone saying something really smart. It might have been Joey Diaz or someone said like, Oh, you don't understand the the power of celebrity. The power of celebrity can sometimes make you do and make you excuse things that you probably would never excuse in your everyday life it does something to you right it, and again we maybe from the outs maybe because it's us and we're young maybe, maybe we can speak to a younger audience i don't know what it is but i'm assuming there is something because i don't pay attention to a lot of these people like day to day but if you are paying attention day to day and you're the people that you're the people you listen to in your walkman and your so walkman, on your itunes or your spotify and stuff they are bona fide stars and celebrities to you in the same way michael jackson would have been to those kids when they were younger right they're on like a sort of exalted level right you sort of look up to them right which you shouldn't they're your idols whatever they may be that's not obviously a good way to go about life but i'm sure that some people do look at these people um uh in a different way than i probably would do right because you know or somebody that doesn't necessarily have the um ties to them or isn't that much in, involved in their music whatever it may be right the point of the matter is if you're a celebrity you definitely can get away with the things that are being alleged that he has basically done because of your notoriety that is 100% a thing. And I guess maybe he's making a Michael Jackson point, maybe because he's saying, oh, I'm not Michael Jackson. I don't have Michael Jackson level money. How much do I need to give somebody to for them to allow me to do X, Y, and Z? Again, it's just a gross point to make. It doesn't necessarily need to be said if that isn't necessarily a thing that you actually did. I guess you sometimes it's good to maybe put that out there and say, hey, I'm not this guy. But again, considering the allegations that are levied against Michael Jackson, considering the fact that some people generally believe that he did those things because he was such a big star that he was able to somehow get the mums and the parents in his spell and they excuse certain things just so they can be next to him. That's what a star celebrity and power and fame does, which is why you see kids standing outside of flipping department stores waiting for their favorite celebrity to come out of the store and running to a car just so they can be in that ambience and have that electricity of all their other stands standing around them. That's what it does to you. So to suggest that somehow that couldn't extend to a family member accepting a situation that they probably wouldn't accept for somebody else outside the family is a bit naive. You get it? But let's just be honest, bro. These people have came out and said what they need to say. This is fake news, bro, in an official statement, bro. You know, I posted this a girl's address on the internet. They've had been getting death threats. All of these things, they've been, they had to move houses. These people are like family to me. I just want to stick to the facts. My label has access to my Instagram account and my management team has. There's three guys on my management team. The whole industry knows if I'm lying, I'm dying. They've all got underage daughters, bro. They're all active on my Instagram account. They can post when they want. They can message someone if they want. They can look at my messages if they want. I've never told them they're not allowed to do that. They, they are the first people that if you know anyone in my team, you will contact if you can't get through to me and ask what's going on. And shout out to the people that did. I respect it. You understand? And they've explained everything to them. You know what I mean? Now, I don't have an issue with this version of the story. If this is the truth, I don't have an issue with it. I don't think anyone would have an issue with it. If this was the story, if this is the version of the story that we got in the beginning, the way the family have been moving, regardless of what's actually occurred behind the scenes, just makes you think 
is this actually legit though? That's the issue. You could, if you would have come out of this before the start, it would have been fine. We've seen examples of the Krypton Conan thing, right? The moment one of his sisters, I think, allegedly tried to throw some mud on his name at a ledger, he was involved in something underage. He immediately came out very strongly, put it in under certain terms. Am I accepting somebody slandering my name in such a way? I'm going to proceed with legal proceedings, put out some proof bits and pieces, da, 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 but I nipped it in the bud very quickly. Same way that Justin Bieber did. Again, Justin Bieber is probably a bad example because he has different types of resources but in terms of level of but in terms of the celebrity that they are right he's young that's valley i'm sure most of his communication with girls and these things have mostly occurred through these social media platforms so he's able to kind of compile some amount of information and receipts and whatever it may be you can clear your name in the same way that justin bieber did when he was alleged to have essentially sexual assault i think two fans as a meet and greet or something and he was able to nip that in a bud in you know in 24 hours with a few receipts pictures from other stand accounts and all this sort of stuff and you know um testimonies from uh, ex-girlfriends whatever it may be but the moment this story came out we had so many different versions of what actually happened we had if you remember the mom came out and allegedly said something along the lines of oh she was the one that was sliding into dutch Avelli's dms through her daughter's dms and that was already off because supposedly that is the what are they really that, that person's related to his old manager so what are they, was he trying to hook up with his old managers it just it just doesn't make any sense that way that was the side of the story that was true then you've got Steph London's side of the story where she was basically alleging to the boy that was involved in the story who's on the 14 year old girl side of family that hey she was maybe essentially gaslighting him and saying oh you're only doing this stuff because I because your father passed away or every uncle don't take it out on Dutch which is already smad um and of course him coming out saying that you know it's a member of my family it just seemed very far-fetched that a hacker would go into his account, leak all these images and texts of him with people with celebrities in the industry, and then purposely go and edit clips or screenshots or messages from his messages with a 14-year-old in order to make him look bad. It just doesn't make any sense. I think when I said it in the beginning, point blank period, he shouldn't be talking to any 14-year-old in his DMs. Doesn't matter if he's a family. No 14-year-old should be involved in the conversation with Dutch Avelli, right? That message should be going straight into your other fault. It shouldn't be you shouldn't even be seeing it. It should just be a thing it just gets dealt with in auto reply. Here's reaching out to Dutch Avelli. Here's a link to my, you know, my flipping fan page, buy a mug, buy the new album, whatever it may be, right? Keep it moving. But you shouldn't be involved in any sort of conversation. You shouldn't be talking about toes. You shouldn't be talking about Ruby Rose pictures, recreations. That shouldn't be ever happening. And I think the moment you saw those messages, unfortunately, alarm bells naturally were going to ring. And no matter how much they explain it, you're always going to have a little bit of a doubt in your head about what exactly happened. And again, especially when you consider the amount of time that's elapsed. Um, if anything I've learned, especially in these last few months, looking at some of these stuff happening with celebrities on social, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of, um, a lot of the points that you win on social, because again, unfortunately, you are kind of try, you know. Uh, try yeah it's, it's essentially trial by social media for most of these occasions it shouldn't be obviously but it unfortunately it is it does this it does help if you get in front of the story and you get your story right at the beginning and stick to it even if you're lying it really does help but if you have various different members of your family coming out and fighting different parts and start defending you in different ways then you are seemingly trying to defend yourself in different ways then you don't defend yourself and then you finally come out and say this it does definitely seem like a bit of a calculated collective uh, effort to ensure your career doesn't fail and of course i said it before like i understand the pressure involved right there's a lot of money involved with dutch Valley. there's a lot of people you know essentially paying their mortgage of the success of his of his success so for sure they're going to go above and beyond to make sure that they can explain this away as best as they can because they can't afford to have him you know not be successful i get it i understand but they also have to be understandable or understanding of why people are a little bit skeptical about how they've explained and about how they've dealt with it now again if the family are okay with it they put out a statement and said they're completely fine with how the chooks talks are there um niece nephew or niece um daughter whatever it may be then that's okay we have to move as i think as a uh 
as fans or with people from the outside we have to move on if the family are okay with you, you have to move on you can't be going around messaging people um, going to people's houses making them move home as if what they're just saying is true that completely is obviously overboard um but i think people are allowed to have reservations but if the family want to move on and they're okay with it and then we have to be okay with it as well these people have daughters as well bro don't get it twisted bro this is not no fucked up situation bro where people are trying to cover for each other bro if my brother was talking to an underage girl like that bro i wouldn't fuck with him bro in fact i would expose him bro what does it mean like that does it mean like the way he was talking to them or does it mean like the way that we he thinks we think he's talking to them because those again let's just be very clear those messages doesn't matter who that person is to you are weird that's what we need to say it's like um do you remember that guy from um back chat when you're touching up his mum in the kitchen, right? What is that guy? You're touching up his mum's bum, right? Regardless of how you explain that, that is not, that's not normal. That's weird, right? We, you, we're always going to respond negative to that. No matter what their relationship is at home, we as a public are always going to say, that is mad that you're feeding up your mum's bum in the kitchen. That's just odd, right? It's just weird. It's some incest shit, and we're never going to, we're never going to look around and say, yeah, that's completely normal. It's like how when you see celebrities and you see them kissing their children on the mouth when they're over 10 years old. It's just odd. It is what it is. Now, if they're okay as a family with it behind closed doors and no one's complaining, cool. It's not, it's not, um, it doesn't make sense for you to kind of be protesting outside of their house with picket signs and shit, um, you know, leaving hateful comments on their posts all the time. If the family are okay with it, they're okay with it. But we as a public are allowed to say, you know what, that's weird. And it is weird. You shouldn't be talking to your 14 year old family member, niece, and telling her about toes and shit and telling about you want to recreate pictures and, you know, sending her. It's just, it's just, you know, all that ha ha he he sort of action on DMs with a 14 year old shouldn't be happening regardless, especially if they're a family member, especially a family member of somebody that's deceased. It's like, yikes. That's the truth of the matter. Stop the narratives and the false lies and these fake news that's going around. Oh yeah, man's talking to a minor, bro. You understand? My label's still backing me 100%. Car, they've got Instagram. They've got... So he's saying... Well, what is he saying then? Is he saying that he's not speaking to a minor? So I guess he's trying to align himself more with that story from the beginning that was like, oh, I was talking to the mum through the young girl's IG. Is that what he's trying to say? Because... <sighs> you were talking to her, though, innit? Who was talking to her then? Was it his three label mates or managers that have his access to his Instagram? And again, there's no, we can't even... This is the issue with all this stuff. Who knows what's true, innit? The, it would just would have been beneficial to have heard him say this in the beginning because, you know, he could have avoided all necessary rumours. It could have avoided all the trouble that his, um, this girl's family allegedly got themselves or, you know, had to kind of endure all this kind of hassle of people, you know, essentially doxing them online stuff. It would have avoided all of this if you just would have come out in the beginning and said, hey, this is the issue. I know this message didn't look mad, but previous to sure, this is my family, blah, 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 blah. whatever. Just that should have been said in the beginning. Not all this waiting, posturing around it by threatening people. Like, it just came across weird, and that's the, that's the issue there. But let's continue. My Instagram access, I've never, ever had a problem with them having access with my Instagram account. It's not a secret place. I'm still on all the DSPs. Do you understand? If this was real news you lot are talking about... But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. If the family aren't, want, don't want to press any charges and don't see anything wrong with it, of course, why would you... The record label's always the last place to react to you... Yeah, it, that's what it seems like. Right? Record labels are like football clubs. When a footballer gets involved in some sort of madness outside of football, they're the, usually the last place that decides whether or not they want to kind of step away or align themselves or not align themselves with the player at, that's been accused. So the fact that he's trying to um, suggest that because his record label is stuck by, is stuck by him, that's, that's some kind of win and that sort of proves his innocence. That's not exactly what happened. What's happened is that the family hasn't necessarily persuade, pursued any charges no one's willing to go on record and say what he's done or what he's alleged to have done is wrong. So it's a non-case. So what is the record label going to do? Are they going to drop you because of a rumor or because of something they've heard online? That's not necessarily how it works, isn't it? So it's it's a little bit of a semantic game. But again, I understand this is career. A lot's on the line, but you know, let's be real here. They will take me off at every platform, bro. We know how this works, bro. We're not stupid, bro. You understand? Stop playing with my name for like and clout, yeah? And just keep it factual, guys. You understand? So this is for the people who had genuine questions and concerns. Do you understand? So 
Say to the people that's hit man up, been supporting man through this, no, that's bullshit, that no man, 100%. You understand? And then that's it. Save. So what do you think? Do you believe the guy or not? Um, personally, I'm, uh, you know, again, if the families are okay with it, then I'll just move on. I'm not going to waste any more energy, you know, keep, keeping my eye on it that much anymore. Um, you know, if the family are okay, if the girl's safe, all that malarkey, that's what basically matters. Of course, unfortunately for Dutch, this is always going to be a stain on his name. You know how it works on social. People are always going to have jokes. People are always going to let off certain <laughs> names and phrases already. I've been seeing kind of being banded around on social already kind of, to, you know, entered into our current lexicon. So that's going to be an unfortunate thing he's going to have to just deal with going forward. But hopefully this is a lesson learned for anybody else out there. Look at the difference in the approach from the Krepton Conan guy. Oh, I think it might have been Conan specifically. I forgot which one it was, but whoever it was who addressed the allegations right off the bat didn't let any sort of lingering doubt kind of persuade in the scene and sort of addressed it front on threatened legal action and sort of kind of you know, got that kind of nipped in the bud even got an apology I think out of one of his sisters um, Dutch, Dutch Valley sisters and look at the reaction of course to him specifically when he got accused of it and how he kind of dealt with it and I think there is definitely a lesson to be learned there if you get accused of something as heinous as what he's been accused of you cannot just go and just allow it just to kind of die out and let the media story sort of like rumble on social media it's not going to burn out this is this is not you know you being accused of stealing a kinder boy enough from a tesco express this is a pretty serious allegation you need to deal with in the most serious and also tactful and considerate way possible it needs to be dealt with humility it needs to be dealt with humbleness it needs to be dealt with as an adult and it needs to be just addressed in the best possible way pos in the best possible way to ensure that you can paint yourself in a way that makes it seem as if you're innocent and it also protects the people that are involved and unfortunately he didn't do any of that um if, if effectively kind of maybe inadvertently helped um the situation get out of hand and allow people to dox but that girl and in general and it to get where it had to get but hey if it's been nipped in the bud it's been nipped in the bud he said what he said i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions regarding it do you think it's true do you think it's not true let me know in the comments down below B -b 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 what else is on here what else do we have what else do we have we have that we have this ba, ba, ba. oh yeah we have um, lastly to end i guess um most of you are aware that now um, it's been confirmed that dj academics has officially left the complex oh god oh, why is it always doing this to me anyway yeah it's been confirmed that dj academics has finally left complex um and it's the end now of guess of everyday struggle the show that was originally created by joe budden um which you know famously had um academics kind of making his quote unquote i guess his industry debut um he was already known for his academics page where he basically highlights um the the kind of the lils and the youngs of the industry and then it sort of of course comes from you know more of a history covering some of the war in Chirac stuff that he was doing on YouTube but for the most part he's sort of making a name for himself for being a little bit of a internet kid and kind of providing a platform for the young kids coming up in the scene and of course Joe Burnham was able to kind of parlay a little bit of that fame and allow him to kind of come on complex and do the everyday struggle show which was a really great um, show in its time that kind of nine month period run that they had nine to ten months where Joe and Ak had some very legendary moments interviews you know you can remember the Joe um, shouting at little Yati about his 360 deal the Pasa Pasa they got involved with Migos at the awards like loads of really interesting and monumental moments but since Joe left or since he was fired or let go or whatever you believe from Complex the show has sort of waned um, no pun intended they've got a few co-hosts to come in and sort of help and then of course long term they had Wayno sitting down replacing Joe Biden in a pretty good addition Wayno is a pretty knowledgeable guy having been in the industry for a long time managed some big artists he knows what he's talking about but in general the overall magic of the show never really um, got rekindled in any sort of meaningful way and it did seem to be a bit of a dying ship in general and um it seems that Complex has maybe recognised that and decided to pull the plug if you believe what you read here from Hot New Hip Hop said DJ Academics who is officially leaving Complex so um, Academics has built his uh, it says he has built his platform into one 
of the most successful brands in hip hop and with and while my, he might be a controversial figure he always thrived on adversity um since all the way back 2017 academics has been a complex employee as he stars on the daily hip hop talk show everyday struggle from joe budden to star to wayno academics has had a plethora of co-hosts alongside him to varying degrees of success i don't like how they don't mention that it was actually joe budden that created the show but hey let's continue um the last few months have been a uh, trying time for the show as academics has suspended following the comments about chrissy teigen so it's interesting part he said he left but if you read online it does make it seem as if like quite possibly his mouth ended up catching up with him and all the stuff he's been saying about certain women in the industry has negatively affected his ability to keep his job it continues it says Eck was ultimately joked about being fired although in the end he came back to the show and apologized for his words today academics took to his twitch and addressed his audience confirming that many are suspected for some time as of mid-december everyday struggle will cease to exist all the while academics is permanently leaving complex Eck expressed gratitude for his time at complex and said that he especially wants to thank Deska for the work that she did for the show's moderator. Hip hop commentator also spoke to Complex Handling of the Freddie Gibbs situation, saying that he felt like his own place of work wasn't showing in proper support. Academics also felt like he had and Complex work going in different directions, making now the best time to leave. Academics also noted that he's known about his decision for a month, but he wanted to wait until everything was finalized before saying anything. Moving forward, Academics will certainly have some more shows and media venture up his sleeve. So, again, if you're at you're gonna obviously do a bit of damage control and paint it out as if like you left but if you read between the lines and you know how the industry moves you know knowing what i know from being on the outside of the inside a little bit it does seem like the sort of tirade he's been on especially with megan the stallion recently especially the comments he said about chrissy teigen in the past um and just generally how he kind of conducts himself have essentially caught up with him and considering how you know um sensitive complex are to being pally pally with people in the industry and the ties they have to certain record labels and certain individuals it only makes sense that he would get fired from that position um so i don't think it's any coincidence at the time he chose to come after megan regarding her shooting into the with tory lanes and the moment he starts to kind of you know go on a bit of a war path concerning certain females or certain in vocal or certain parts of the industry like rock nation he had a lot of words to say about that you know of course i'm jay-z's um record labeling company it's no coincidence that during that whole time the one of the kind of consequences of that whole tirade has been him losing his job at complex the interesting part of it is i think from my point of view it seems like he's a little bit sad about the situation more so of course i think because he loved having a job as uh, much as he's making a lot of money on youtube i think the idea of kind of being aligned with complex having that sort of like mainstream visibility a lot you know being able to be near certain artists and have that certain kind of communication which you probably wouldn't have on his own platform that cosign it gives him opens up a few doors here and there legitimizes his platform those are all things that he probably couldn't have done on his own right because i think he would have always continued to be treated as a bit of a as a bit of an aside to the industry right a bit of a necessary new nuisance let's say but the fact that he got welcome into complex allowed him then to get welcome to certain industry rooms and whatever it may be and it kind of helped to kind of overall level up his musical opinion because if you remember the early show the early shows that caught on everyday struggle with joe budden the one thing that was very evident from academics was that he didn't really have that much his musical opinions or understanding of the industry weren't necessarily at the level you'd expect it to be for somebody of his sort of standing he was quite naive in a lot of aspects he didn't really know that much about the industry but of course having more um, exposure to it of course sitting down with someone like a joe budden and having more conversation with people that were coming in his dms or went to you know help him people went and help with certain things and we speak to people behind the scenes he sort of naturally started to gain a bit more understanding of what was going on and as it is no it's no coincidence over time his opinions improved right his level of understanding improved a little bit more um so that made sense but i don't know I, when i when i listened to him speak about it, obviously on twitch earlier it did seem like he was quite regret grateful about what how it kind of transpired and it maybe does maybe feel that he kind of maybe feels like he was the one that got the show cancelled because of course if they fire him they can't get someone to replace him you know he's the best person for the job right so as soon as he's fired the show has to end but this is just like an aside from it. it's like a side gig right but for the other two people in the industry the other two hosts co-hosts in terms of nadesca nadesca sorry and wayno this was a probably a really big gig for them so to get this cancelled is a big deal right it's going to affect them a lot more than it's going to affect him so he probably feels a level of guilt 
concerning that as well you know that he's kind of got away with it it's not got away with it but he's kind of you know he's he'll be able to bounce back from this a lot easier than they will in terms of what they're able to do further on going forward i'm sure that that's going to be fine she'll get some hosting job doing something else down the line but that maybe was probably why he was a bit more morose about it and you know is it, it, regardless of what standing you have how much money you have in the bank getting let go anywhere is sometimes a little bit embarrassing so that's maybe part of it and also considering the circumstances too because there was again no coincidence that the moment he got let go from complex or from everyday struggle he initially straight away went on twitch and started ragging on megan the stallion right really going in on her saying she's not that good she's only getting a sympathy for her why is she winning all these awards her album was mid he was really going extra extra hard on megan the stallion it did seem like he kind of was acting as if like the the leash got let go right someone unbuckled the leash and allowed him just to kind of like run free and do his thing and that's probably what he initially wanted anyway in the first place and now he definitely knows that he can't say these certain things in certain rooms so he's definitely going to double down and do that thing on his platform so that's basically what happened academics is no more everyday struggle everyday struggle is completely done finito and um, i guess if you're an op of academics you're probably going to be happy about it but i think if you're a kid watching it, you're probably going to be sad that the show finished i think it did serve a purpose in that regard for myself i haven't watched a single episode since joe budden left he was he was the only interesting part of the show plus with the addition of the desk and academics i think it helped to make it but of course majority of the time you're watching it for joe so without him on there a big post of the show i sort of kind of was disinterested with and again just considering x early musical opinion i didn't really rate what he had to say so i kind of didn't give him a chance to evolve and grow of course over time i heard some clips of his and he did sound a bit more intelligent intelligible concerning the industry and concerning music but still it was enough for me to keep attention and maybe that was the case but i still think the viewing figures were pretty high still considering it was a show that didn't even much it didn't need much effort to make right it was in the studio that they have in their own complex offices it required no real prep beforehand for the, if you believe what star says on the usual youtube show act basically had a bottle of hennessy next to his chair all the time every morning drinking before the show so it was a pretty relaxing environment so i don't think it required much investment for them to get the show done and going and put out there with clips and stuff it just you know but it just didn't want the hassle of having to deal with academics his tirades when he turns when he kind of leaves the complex offices and goes back home um into his basement or whatever it may be so i guess that's what happened anyway academics is left let me know in the comments down below if you care i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions anyway that's the excellent thing show episode number Oh, let me get this up again. It always does that. Next time, this show episode number four zero four. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time tuning to show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, app, please download and share the show. And of course, until next time, I'll see you guys very very soon. Take care, be safe, all that malarkey, and again, see you again very very soon. Peace.